So anyway, here we are on another uh, Sergeant Cypress uh, serpentine outcrop. Okay, you can see the ultramorphic soils, the serpentine barrens. Now, where we are is Sonoma County, which is a land that's known, unfortunately, for its uh, abundancy of horrible vineyards. And uh, they do wine tours and all sorts of corny shit on the weekends. But uh, none of that is around us right now. We're in an, a ver very lovely Sergeant Cypress forest. Uh, Hesperocypress sargentii only grows in Northern California. Uh, there's a population or two uh, in Los Padres a National Forest down there in Central California along the Central Coast, but it always grows on serpentine. It grows fine off of serpentine, too. I germinated a couple of them, got them up there. Some of them are 20 feet tall now, but uh, it, it does enjoy the serpentine as it's where, uh, you know, it's uh, nothing else can compete with it. So it's got the, it's got a monopoly on a serpentine and uh it's uh, extremely tolerant of this uh, harsh serpentine soil. Over here we got Dendramicon regida, which is a nice uh, species in the poppy family. It's a perennial woody, shrubby poppy. As you can see, you get up close to one of these flowers, you see dozens of stamens surrounding a central ovary. Here's one where the stamens have fallen off. That flower's been pollinated. Now this uh, ovary, of course, will enlarge. Where is it? Right there. This ovary will enlarge and form a capsule uh you know an elongated capsule that will then contain uh, dozens upon dozens of tiny seeds many of which will lay in the soil for years until uh, a fire uh, comes through and uh, in which case they will re-sprout anyway, why don't you take a look at this this nice erythronium liliaceae the lily family what a beaut Still going off, even though this is one of the first to flower. It should be done by now, but you got kind of a uh, spot that's out of direct sun that can hang on a little longer here. Here's the basal leaves. These, of course, are just seedlings which uh, have not uh, gathered up enough energy to fruit this year. Maybe next year or the year after. This, of course, is a calicortis, which you can see over here. Same family, Liliaceae, real nice lilies. Yeah, there you go. There's uh, there's Calicortis tomei, up close and personal. What a wonderful genus. Lots of speciation in California. Dozens upon dozens of species, many of them rare, many of them uh, endemic to small regions, narrow endemics, a lot of them localized. Now, now look at this guy. This is kind of weird, okay? Now, this just looks like a moss or something, right? But it's actually in a coffee family. This is a gallium species, and it's in Rubiaceae. When you get up close, you can see it's got tiny flowers. See those four petals right there? Lots of speciation in this, too. you got a lot of diversity in this genus in California, and this, evidently, is one that appears to love serpentine soil. Now, here's another lovely illustration of serpentine. You can see that uh, over there you got some nice thick forest. Uh, you know, probably very dark, nice canopy. And uh, right here, you just got barrens. And open. I mean, here's a road, of course, but over there, you just got good old barrens. It's very open, nothing gets too tall. Uh, it's pretty low growing. Now, you could, you could tell this is a road, obviously, but this land has not been disturbed at all. The only reason that that grows more open and uh, nothing gets too tall in it is because of the soil type. So that's serpentine soil. And then where the serpentine soil is overlain, by a, uh, I don't want to say healthier, but a uh, soil that's much more amenable to plant growth, uh, you get the actual forest cover, etc. So that would be here if it were not for this serpentine uh, soil uh, being present here, this ultramorphic soil. And so it's pretty amazing to see these barrens as they occur, uh, you know, if you're looking on a satellite map, etc. And of course, where you get ultramorphic soils, you get really interesting plants because I hope I'm not too uh, errant and too much in saying this, but serpentine basically causes new species to arise uh, in uh, various uh, plant families. So this guy right here is Streptanthus, and I believe it's Streptanthus morrisonii. Streptanthus, of course, has about 15 species that are uh, extremely rare and or localized uh, to serpentine. So this is a in the kale family, and it looks, the whole kale family kind of puts me to sleep, except for this genus. And Colanthus, maybe. Actually, there's a there's a couple native uh, uh, brassicas that uh, are pretty intriguing. But Streptanthus, of course, has gone through so much radiation and specialization 
on this harsh barren soil this ultramafic serpentine and so it's it's very adaptable and it seems like it's got the it, it's basically it looks like it seems like it's pre-adapted it's got something going on with this plant where it's able to it's pre-adapted to just tolerate this this harsh soil which of course is is low in calcium and low in nitrogen and high in the magnesium and high in the iron and especially the nickel which is a toxic metal that various species of streptanthus can hyperaccumulate uh, in their tissue as a means of uh, uh, warding off uh, herbivores and other little insects that might prey on them. Now here's another uh, plant you find on serpentine a lot, Epilobium minutum. Onogracia evening primrose family. There's a bunch of different species of Epilobium of course. Some get much bigger than this. You got the fireweed is an Epilobium which of course gets up to three feet tall. And then uh, has little dandelion looking seeds that are spread via wind. So anyway, there's a seep right there, which is basically just a slow trickle of water. And where you got water, you're going to have this plant right here. If I can get out here without breaking my ass. Rhododendron occidental, also known as azalea. A plant that often smells so pleasant you could smell it from 20 feet away. Comet throughout Northern California and very tolerant to serpentine too. But these guys didn't even open yet. Look at that. Fuck, I could smell it right now. Ericaceae, blueberry family, rhododendron accident tail. Look at that, see there's a nice barren pygmy forest, huh? It's Sergeant Cypress down there and a species of Arctostaphylos, possibly Glaca. They all top out at about five feet. Then of course where the soil changes beyond that you could see uh, the knob cone pine and the dug fir are thriving. Because the soil is not impoverished like it is here, or toxic like it is here. Oh, I love serpentine. Anyway, so here we go, the first, uh, first Time for me seeing this very narrow endemic, recently described species, Streptanthus vernalis. So called because it's uh, the spring flowering jewel flower. It's one of the first to flower. Probably derived from Morrisonii, but uh, of course much smaller. And of course the Morrisonii are nowhere, nowhere near close to flowering. And this delicate bastard, which tops out at about six inches, is already gone off. Look at that nice. I think it was named in 2006 or something like that. I don't know. It was named recently. Real beaut. And again, just confined to this small ridge. So this species likely just emerged. Who knows how recently? Last hundred, last couple hundred, last couple thousand, ten thousand years. Who knows? So anyway, there's not many photos of this plant out there because it was just recently named. And uh, it's a narrow endemic. It only occurs on this, this small little bit of serpentine in Sonoma County on the border of Sonoma and Lake County. And I was looking at photos of it, and I was thinking, you know, it, it just looks kind of like Morrisonii, that other Streptanthus species that up, that's up here. But then, now that I'm here seeing it, and there's a bunch right there, just dotting the serpentine talus, hard to see if you're far away, they blend in. Because it probably gets hot here. They got small leaves and they got small flowers. But now that I see it in person, this is, this is a valid species, not like I'm by any means any kind of authority on Streptanthus. But this looks nothing like Morrisonii in the phenology that is when it flowers is uh, completely different from Morrisonii. I mean, this thing's going off uh, and Morrisonii is nowhere even close to going off. Probably another couple months before that starts flowering. Look at how dainty this fucker is, too. Look at those tiny flowers. Look at those tiny. Oh, they're beautiful. So nice and frilly and yellow and white. Growing on the talus, on the serpentine talus, on the brutal environment of the serpentine talus. Jack! How about us? Do you want a sausage? I got some domas. Which you go, Stratanthus vernalis, getting pollinated by some uh, what appear to be native bumblebees. Now oh, there's some fruits already. Look at it! Dozens upon dozens of them. And the serpentine talus. And then you get up here, you can see Morrisonii, which is, of course, uh, 
and this is just pure conjecture the plant that it's assumed that they're derived from you can see how different it looks these are the tiny bastards look at the inflorescence of these too it's, it's tiny it's small they're flowering here on may 2nd or 3rd whatever the hell date it is and here's this one more sonii which has a inflorescence that's uh got the leaves all the way up the stem you know and it's probably 18 inches tall none of these this species vernalis none of these get taller than eight inches at most and even that's pushing it that's a eight inches is a big one most of them are tiny you can see the habitat manzanita pinus sabiniana sergeant cypress There you go, look at that. Put these two bastards close together in a police lineup. You can tell them apart real easy, not just in phenology, i.e. one's flowering in early May and the other is not, but also just in leaf morphology too. I mean, look at this, this, this is done. This is an annual, this guy's done. He's topping out at six inches. He's gonna be over in a month. The flowers here are already drying up. This whole area, because like I said, this gets hot. You know, there's no cover here. It's just bare rock. It's, it's a barren almost desert environment, even though uh, we're still in the coast ranges and you got, you know, forest over there. But uh, and then you look at the Morrisonii, okay? And it's the first year. This first year, before, Morrisonii is a biennial. So you get that first year, basal rosette, and then second year he sends up that inflorescence, gets an elongated peduncle, gets up to 18 inches tall. I mean, you could really see there's two different species. They look drastically different. Uh, but they still got that nice blue coloration. And, uh, you know, I think I'm more Sony. The flowers might be yellow, too. Which makes sense, when, uh, you know, how this guy derived from it. But it's just cool to see speciation in action. This has just emerged as a species. And it hasn't had time uh, to basically disperse yet. And so, you know, the more I learn about some of these, these quote, newer species, these, these small flowering plants, these annuals, the, the more my mind is blown and the more loosely... Uh, I come to understand is is the the line that delineates what's a species and what's not. You know, maybe this thing will arise, maybe it'll disperse. Uh, you know, rises a new species, maybe it'll disperse throughout other strep, uh, other serpentine areas in this uh, region. Maybe it won't. Maybe it'll just die out, and that'll be it. You know, but I, I by no means do I want to use a you know a species going extinct as some sort of excuse for all the heinous shit humanity's doing because that's bullshit, but it does just make you think about how species evolve uh, and just what exactly a species is and and uh, just the, the general evolutionary turnover of life here on planet Earth. You get the nice, healthy, verdant green forest over there, okay? Where there's no serpentine, then you get to the serpentine, you get the barrens, of course, but I just love uh, this exposure right here. Look at what's going on. You can see all different sorts of shimmery minerals in there. Could it be cinnabar? Which is, of course, is mercury ore, which is uh, one of the prime things uh, that was mined out of serpentine rock exposures. Mercury and, uh, aka quicksilver, mercury and uh, chromium. But of course, you got the crumbles very easily. Very unstable rock on the surface in terms of weathering. But you could just tell this was a very geologically violent event. This was accreted to the continent from the west in a subduction zone, but you could tell it was likely buried, uh, submerged deep beneath the crust in that subduction zone, just from all these different veins of various minerals. You got your blues and your reds in there, okay? And then, of course, there's the, the water action, too, because it's an oceanic crust. It's getting, uh, there's water in that subduction zone as well. So this was probably submerged for a while and then later uplifted, you know, slapped onto the edge of the North American plate and then, of course, later uplifted. Just a very, I mean, it's a beautiful rock, but just it tells a story of a very geologically violent event as well. And of course, the soil's got a ton of nickel in it, too. Very tight. So we've established that serpentine and ultramafic soils in a way, create new species of plants. Could it be that this particular region, this particular soil chemistry, and the ways in which it differs from other serpentine outcrops, could it be that this, in its own way, created Streptanthus vernalis, which again is only known 
from about right there to uh, over there. Who knows, you know? And it's not so much about the individual plant, though it is a gorgeous one. It's more about learning how different species evolve, how they're dependent on geology, and then how uh, they radiate. Very fascinating stuff. All of it extremely fascinating stuff. Will Streptanthus vernalis disperse to other serpentine regions? If so, how will it do that? Or will it just erupt and it, it, will it just stay here where it erupted and stick around this joint for a while and then eventually morph into a new species, hybridize with another species of Streptanthus? Who knows what will happen? Or will it in the end prove to be more adapted than it's... Uh, what is thought to be its parent species, Streptanthus morrisonii. I don't know, but I think about this stuff and it gets me hot. It's pretty interesting to think about, you know? That's all I got. So anyway, here you go. Here's a possible uh, explanation for uh, how Vernalis arose as a species. You got Streptanthus brewerii, which is a pretty widespread, I guess, uh, you know, compared to Vernalis. This uh, occurs uh, in multiple serpentine areas, serpentine soil areas throughout Northern California. Dainty little bastard, doesn't get that big. That's Streptanthus brewerii. Kind of blends in with the soil nice. Pretty interesting. And then down here, growing sympatrically with it, aka growing in the same fucking geographical area, is Streptanthus morrisonii. Also pretty widespread, especially compared to Vernalis. Could Vernalis be of hybrid origin between Vernalis... Ver, fucking excuse me, Jesus Christ. Too much coffee. Between... Morrisonii and Brewerite. It could be. It could be. Who knows? So normally when you get new species that arise, it's normally because of the opening of some kind of ecological niche. But another way you could get a new species to arise is, of course, of hybrid origin. So could it be that you got two species of Streptanthus, both occurring sympatrically on serpentine? You got Brewerite and Morrisonii. And uh, they end up hybridizing, i.e., a bee transfers pollen from one of those species to another and they end up making a hybrid which is very both fertile and very successful and uh, you get in those species Streptanthus vernalis which uh, is basically really only occurs on this hill this this hill from right there to the other side right there so it's basically only occurring in a two or three hundred yard area if that but where it is occurring it's very abundant there's hundreds of plants uh, in this wash there's many more on the other side down slope right there it's much more successful and much more abundant than either of uh, the other two species more sony eye or brewer eye real interesting shit to think about and again this tiny little hill is the only place that this plant grows or is known to grow at least so very likely it originated here uh, relatively recently. Who knows how long ago that could be. That could be a couple hundred years ago. It could be a couple thousand years ago. It could have been a couple decades. Either way, it, it evolved here, likely, pure conjecture, and it just hasn't had a chance to disperse out yet. And so that's why it's only occurring on this hill, but like I said, it's much more ecologically successful here than uh, the other two species, Brewerii or Morrisonii. It's doing its thing. There's a lot more of it. It's doing a great job. Whereas Morrisonii and Brewerii, I have not seen that many plants uh, compared to the hundreds of Vernalis that I've seen down there. Anyway, that Streptanthus uh, only occurs one hill over there. But I want to take you into this uh, uh, Sergeant Cypress woodland. It's basically a pig pygmy forest where none of these trees, uh, which can normally get upwards of uh, 80 feet tall none of them top out more than six feet tall because the soil here is so brutal But uh, look at this nice little can I found who knows how long it's been uh, Abandoned on this ridge now. This is private property. We are trespassing. So, uh, you know likely uh, no one's been here uh, Botanizing this Jesus Christ botanizing this area in a while, but I wanted to show you one of these chaparral orchids we get if I can get true true there without breaking my ass. There's basically a, a species of terrestrial orchid that grows in chaparral. Nah, I'm not gonna be able to get through there. Oh, I could see it though. Jesus Christ, oh fuck. 
my ace over here. Break my ace getting true. There we go. Now it's not flowering yet, so it's hard to say just what species it is. But it is a true orchid. It's in the genus Piperia, and uh, I think they might have lumped it into Platanthera now. But you can see it's got a perennial uh, root down there that it comes up from every year. No idea how many years they tend to do their thing. Five, six, two, three, I don't know. But uh, being an orchid, it of course is symbiotic with fungi in the ground, which is odd because the uh, cypresses don't, uh, they're not ectomycorrhizal. They, they have AM, like most things in the cypress and redwood family, they have arbuscular mycorrhizae, AM fungi, which uh, are, I believe, endophytic. They go into the roots. So, uh, you know, pine trees produce uh, fungi that produce actual mushroom caps like you would, uh, you know, like what you'd normally think of as a mushroom. Boletes, chanterelles, those are basidiomycete, ectomycorrhizal fungi. Uh, cypresses and redwoods don't use utilize those types of mycorrhizae. They use what's called AM fungi. But uh, this, all, all orchids are mycorrhizal. They, they need fungus. They're symbiotic with ground fungi. Or uh, if they're epiphytic tropical orchids, they need a... Of course, uh, uh, fungi that uh, are not in the ground. Obviously, it's just the decomposed uh, material on the tree branches and the humid subtropical forest they grow in. Anyway, this is a Piperia species, which is apparently not Platanthera. No idea which uh, which species of chaparral orchid it, it could be, but uh, they're pretty remarkable. If you turn that that leaf over. You know, you I mean, you see the, the parallel ven venation that all monocots have, but if you turn that leaf over, you got that kind of sheen to it, which uh, is not a 100% good for diagnosis, but is a, is a general, uh, if you see, if you see two leaves coming out, okay, and you flip one over, you got that sheen to it, uh, there's just, the, by the texture of the leaf, you can normally tell, at least if you're in California, if it's one of these terrestrial orchids, the Piperias or the Platantheras. And uh, again, we'll have to wait and see what his flowers. Probably got another month before he opens up. Maybe two weeks before he opens up. Look at it. The entire population of this strip tank this only grows right here. In this one little hill. Only place in the world it grows. In this one little hill and gully right there. <laughs>